We have handout notes available, like always. If you'd like to write some things down as we get going through here, we should have, have some available online as well. For those of you attending from home, it's good to see you. I see you here on the phone checking in, so it's a good, uh, good to have you. And for anybody who's outside, welcome to you all also. And uh, definitely that time of year, things are changing out there. Um, we're still, still having a lot of visitors come through, which is still nice. So welcome to all of you who are giving a little bit of your vacation time to join us here at church. It's uh, always a pleasure. We are in 1 Thessalonians. So you can go ahead and make your way there. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. If you wonder where that is, that is right before 2 Thessalonians. So if that helps you out. Let's ask the Lord to teach us here. Indeed, God, we ask that you would teach us. Uh, we we want to be quick to hear, uh, slow to speak, and slow to anger when it comes to you and your word. Uh, we we want to just hear what you have to tell us, even if it's convicting or challenging. Uh, we want to humble our hearts and our minds, and we want to lay aside our own human reasoning and opinions, and we want to just simply feed upon your word today. Renew our minds as we consult with this text here. We do believe that it is your inspired word and that it is the standard for us and that through this we get to know you more. And so please lead us in this time, God. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Have you ever taken on a task, poured your life, poured so much of your time and energy and money, like literally your life into something, all to find out in the end, after it's all done, that it was all done in vain? You ever had something like that happen? It is so frustrating. Um, I, I, just a couple of lightweight examples. Um, I saw a video, short video clip a couple weeks ago of a family who uh, had a couple of kids, a couple of boys, and they were doing the, the typical thing where you take a caterpillar and you watch it through all of its stages. So they started with the egg and it hatched. They cared for this little caterpillar through the larval stage and then into the chrysalis and they waited and watched and they saw it come out emerging as a butterfly and they were just so excited that they've watched and cared for this little butterfly this entire time, and now it's time to release it out into the world so that it can carry on in the next season of life. And so the family's all gathered around, the little butterfly in the jar, and they take the lid off, and out comes the butterfly. And gathered with the family watching this grand releasing event is also the family cat who proceeds to jump up amazingly and snag the butterfly then proceed to eat it right in front of the family. And I watched that, and of course, I, I just chuckled, and I'm like, that is so like a cat. But you got to think that there was a bit of a disappointment in there. You know, all of this time, all of this care for that, come on. Or maybe you saw the video like I did of the older couple that found the little baby squirrel, and they took so much time to... Uh, raise this squirrel so that it could be out on its own and they go and they release it and they put it on the side of the tree the wife is recording as the husband puts it up there and she's like you know let him go let him go and he's finally you know parting ways and he gets the squirrel to take a few little hops and then the cat jumps up and grabs the squirrel you hear sc screeching and squeaking and then of course screaming from the wife who's video recording and then it cuts and uh, you imagine what uh, proceeded there. And again, it's like, uh, moral of the story is not cats ruin everything, but <laughs> you might think that. But I, I, the concept of these folks pouring so much time and energy into getting this squirrel ready to go out and live and thrive, all to see it taken down by the cat. And they say, what a waste, it was all in vain. Maybe for you, and it has been for me, at times, a car repair or a home appliance project. Something's not working. And so 
being a non-professional but still trying to be a responsible homeowner or vehicle owner, I'm going to take this on and do it myself. And so you diagnose what you think is the problem and you uh, research the parts and you take all the time to do that. You spend the money to buy the part and, oh, you need special tools for this, for this work. So you buy that and then you wait and then the part arrives and then you put in the time and the dedication to fix it or you, what you think is fix the, the problem and you start it up again and you realize, nope, that wasn't the problem. It's still broken and you go, ugh. All that time, all that money, all the investment of making the repair, and it still doesn't work. What a waste. Maybe you have experienced something like that in life. Well, when it comes to ministry for God, investing our life into what God is doing here on earth, we desperately hope that the things that we do, in the end, we don't look back and say, man... That was done in vain. Uh, maybe it's after a short-term project, mission project, just a few days or a few weeks. Maybe it's a long-haul investment of many years of life. We would hate to look back and say, man, I was doing all of that, and in the end, I realized it's all in vain. I don't know if you've ever thought about that from a ministry perspective, because we as followers of Christ, as disciples of Christ, we are to have a personal ministry with people around us? Have you ever wondered about that in your own life? It is common, it is normal, it is a good thing for us to be concerned that the things that we invest in, the things that we're doing, are not for nothing in the end. Instead, that they last. Why do we, why do we care? Why are we concerned? Well, we want to do our best for God. We want to bear fruit for Him that will have an eternal impact. Even the Apostle Paul was concerned at times that some of the work he had been doing for God, he was concerned that, well, is this in vain? One example, for instance, is in Galatians chapter 2. He reports that early on in his ministry, he had to go and meet with the apostles and other prominent church leaders in the early church to present the things that he was doing and teaching to make sure they were acceptable because he says, and I quote, for fear that he might be running or had run in vain, meaning his ministry, conducting his ministry, that it was all in vain. He was even concerned. Well, thankfully, there are promises in Scripture that help us to take courage and to find comfort in those moments that arise when we wonder. 1 Corinthians 15, 58, I know many of us have it memorized, and we hold on to that verse. It says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor or your toil is not in vain in the Lord. Meaning when we are doing work for the Lord in His strength, we know that it's not in vain. That gives us comfort. Uh, for Isaiah 55 10 and 11, in relation to the Word of God, God speaking through Isaiah says, For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there without watering the earth and making it bare and sprout and furnishing seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so will my Word be which goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me empty or void without accomplishing what I desire and without succeeding in the manner for which I sent it. So even God's word doesn't go out and return void or empty. There is uh, some value and su success in even doing just preaching the word of God. Well, as we turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, we find Paul thinking back, kind of reminiscing in a way with the Thessalonian believers thinking back to the ministry he had there with them, a relatively short period of time, but nonetheless, that period of time, and how he knew that that ministry was a success. It wasn't a ministry endeavor that was done in vain. How satisfying it is to engage in ministry for God and have the assurance that it is successful, that it is being a success that it's not for nothing. 
Now, defining success in ministry, that can be what is somewhat tricky because you have what the human perspective would say looks successful. And then there's the divine perspective from God's point of view, what is actual success. We tend to say, well, success means numbers in attendance. The more in numbers uh, of people in attendance, the more successful, or a bigger budget, or a name that everyone recognizes, or maybe it's uh, measured in the amount of conversions and the amount of disciples made. Well, any and all of those things might describe the byproduct of a successful ministry, but none of those things actually define success in ministry from God's perspective. We know it's not about numbers, otherwise Jesus would have been considered wrong by commending the church in Philadelphia in, uh, Ro- in uh, Revelation chapter 3. Uh, a little church, with just a little bit of power, uh, or any of these churches that started off very small, they would have all been looked at as failures. So we know it's not about numbers. We know it's not about big budgets. Otherwise, the church in Jerusalem would have been looked at as a failure. Remember how poor that church became during the persecution? Paul was traveling around on his missionary journeys, appealing to poor groups of of believers, saying, do you want to contribute to the needs of the saints in Jerusalem? So we know it's not about big numbers of money. And we know it's not actually found in many conversions. Or else Isaiah would have been looked at as a massive failure for all of those years preaching on behalf of God and seeing no people come to repentance. Was Isaiah a failure? No. So we know it's not about those things. Well, if it's not about those things, then what is it? Paul, in the first six verses of 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, reveals at least five specific qualities that characterize successful ministry from God's perspective. This ministry effort that he was involved in among them, as he says in verse 1, was not in vain. It was not for nothing. It was successful. It did not fail. So let's read what Paul has to say specifically. Chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. For you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain. But after we had already suffered and been mistreated in Philippi, as you know, we had the boldness in our God to speak to you the gospel of God amid much opposition. For our exhortation does not come from error or impurity or by way of deceit, But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who examines our hearts. For we never came with flattering speech, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed, God is witness, nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or from others, even though as apostles of Christ we might have asserted our authority. We'll stop right there. What we discover in reading this text is that there are specific qualities that characterize successful ministry as God sees it. Paul says in verse 1, you yourselves know, brethren, in other words, you were there, you witnessed this, that our coming to you was not in vain. That time they spent there, it was not a failure. It was valuable, it made an impact, it was successful. What qualities made his ministry there successful? Again, Paul gives at least five. Let's observe these together today, and as we do so, not only evaluate the church that you're part of, this church, if you're here, if you're visiting today, your home church, uh, but also take a look at this on a personal level, for as disciples of Jesus Christ, we are all to be his ambassadors and ministers. Do these qualities, do they describe you? I need to ask, do these describe me? So the first quality we observe found in verses 1 and 2 is a bold confidence in God. A bold confidence in God. Surely when they arrived in Thessalonica, when they first arrived, they were quite a sight to see, especially Paul and Silas. Why? 
What had happened just days before they arrived? Paul relates here that they had been beaten and imprisoned in Philippi. Acts chapter 16 gives the scriptural and historical account. Just to put it very, very briefly, very summarized, uh, after conducting some successful ministry there, there was a period of a few days where as they were going about preaching the gospel, there was a demon-possessed, fortune-telling slave girl following them, advertising for them. She was saying the right stuff, but uh, of course Paul and Silas and Timothy don't want advertisement from the local demon-possessed, wacky girl. And as it says in the text, out of great annoyance, which I think find even funnier, Paul turns around and he casts the demon out of that girl. Well, that's good for her, you know, she is now free of that, and she probably came to know the Lord after that, but the supernatural power portion of her uh, fortune-telling ministry and the things she did, that was now gone, and it made her owners very angry. So their owners dragged Paul and Silas before the city officials, had them beaten, and had them thrown into the inner prison, uh, the inner jail cell, and locked in stocks. And so here are Paul and Silas beaten up, locked up in stocks. And we, we find them in the middle of the night, there in prison, not having a pity party, not feeling sorry for themselves or scared. We find them singing hymns. A very interesting moment. And God used that and an earthquake to break the jail cells apart and used a number of things to bring the jailer and the jailer's family to faith in Jesus Christ. It was a successful ministry they had there. There was a unique church born in the city of Philippi. Very diverse group of people. And uh, yet in, despite all of this, Paul and Silas and Timothy had to leave. Now remember, Luke was with them, but from this point on, Luke doesn't say we in the book of Acts. So Luke probably stayed in Philippi to help that little church keep going. But Paul and Silas and Timothy had to leave. Where was their next stop? Thessalonica. And so we find now in Acts chapter 17, Paul and Silas, with wounds still fresh on their backs arriving in Thessalonica. And what do they do? They continue to preach the gospel. What on earth would motivate these guys to be so bold? They knew the type of responses the gospel would elicit. Some would believe and be happy about it, but the vast majority would be angry and become violent. So what would cause them to enter into this with the, the bruises still, perhaps their wounds were maybe starting to scab slightly, but they were fresh. What would cause them to keep pressing on? They had boldness in God. Notice it says in verse 2 that they did find opposition, much opposition in Thessalonica. And we see that actually, we see the details of it in Acts chapter 17. But what caused them to be so bold? It was their confidence in God. It wasn't just a boldness that they mustered up within themselves saying, you know, we're doing good things, we're here for a good cause, we're not hurting anybody, uh, yeah, we can handle this. It wasn't just pep talking one another, you got this, you got this. No, it was a confidence, a boldness in God. They didn't think they were there just to teach their own words, their own ideas. They weren't standing there representing some dead guy in a tomb. They were there and bold, knowing they were serving the one true living God and the risen Savior, Jesus Christ. For a church to be successful, it must exhibit boldness and confidence, not in their own abilities or strengths, or networks, or deep financial pockets, or anything like that, but instead in God. If these guys did not find their boldness and confidence in God, they would have been terrified for themselves entering into Thessalonica. Instead, they would have gone in and said, you know what, I think maybe we should just go put up our beach chair on the Aegean coast here on the beach and maybe sip our iced tea and just kick back 
Hey, keep a low profile. Let our wounds heal. No, they had a bold confidence in God. That's in part what made their ministry successful. A second quality in verse 3, they had teaching that is grounded in the truth. He points out their exhortation. This word exhortation could be translated preaching, but it really constitutes all that they were teaching, all that they were speaking. And notice he says that it did not come from error. What this means is that the substance of their teaching wasn't flawed human reasoning and ideas. That was not the subject of their teaching, the substance of their teaching. They came teaching and preaching the gospel and the truths of God's word. Paul will point it out later in verse 13, but he'll say that they received their words as they really were, the words of God. They didn't look at their words as the words of man, but as the words of God. That's what Paul and Silas and Timothy came preaching, were the words of God. It is a temptation for ministries and teachers to teach human ideas and philosophies, to emphasize current events and political views, because it draws attention. And the more edgy you can get with those things, the more people will tune in and the more people will listen. So that, therefore, it becomes a great temptation to emphasize all of that. Though it does bring in a lot of attention, it does not make for eternal impact. Why? Because human reason and human ideas are flawed, they are fading, they are temporary. God's Word is what is eternal. To address this temptation and tendency that preachers and teachers have to preach those kinds of things other than the Word, Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy 4.2, and he said, preach the Word. Make the substance of your preaching the Word, the Word of God. Don't be tempted to go and preach other things. Preach the Word whether it's preaching season or not. Use it to repro reprove, rebuke, exhort, and instruct. We may be tempted to stay relevant by veering from the Bible to preach and talk about things people would rather hear. And that may be bring big numbers and success from a human vantage point. It may look like it, we need to keep our teaching grounded in the absolute truth of the Bible. We don't want to have a ministry that we look back upon and say it was in vain. Well, these guys, in part, had a successful ministry because their teaching was not contaminated with error coming from human philosophies and ideas and reason. Notice also their motive of their teaching wasn't selfish or deceptive. Their teaching didn't come from impurity, he said. What do they mean by that? That word directly alludes to sexual immorality, which again, you're like, okay, well, what does that mean? Many of the teachers of their day, and let's be real, many teachers of our day and religious leaders of our day in the world have a motive to use their spiritual authority to sexually exploit the people that they're supposed to be caring for. I mean, how many examples, I'm not even going to list the many examples that we have from even like the last couple of years, if you pay attention, how many spiritual leaders have been convicted of uh, sexual immorality? We see examples of it all the time. People using their religious authorities to manipulate and sexually exploit the people they are to be caring for. Well, common in many of the religious practices back in Paul's day and around that area, and he will point it out directly later in chapter 4, but sexual immorality was a foundation of many of the worship service and practices of these um, false religions. There were temples to certain gods and goddesses with priests and priestesses that were engaging in ritual prostitution with the general public. 
and saying that that was an act of worshiping such and such god or goddess. And therefore, if you wanted to appease that god, you would hire one of the priests or priestesses and engage in immorality. One can see how this would really drive deep immoral hooks into the people. We say that today, pornography has a deep immoral hook into many people's lives. It's a problem, but consider adding to that the actual physical involvement with the, the religious leaders and it having been justified as part of your religious duties and acts of worship. You can see how it was uh, um, a very strong grip in the people. Well, Paul wanted to be very clear, and he points out that they knew this too. He says this in verse 1. You, you know this, you're witnesses. But their ministry there among the Thessalonians was not motivated by any sexually immoral agenda. He wasn't there to try to exploit the people like some of the other religious leaders to get sexual favors. It was not about that. Nor, he says, was this by way of deceit. This word deceit, interesting, it actually means bait or fish hook. Now, I'm a fisherman, so I'm not dogging fishermen by any means, uh, but let's just talk about this. And I know we've got a lot of fishermen in here, and you know this is good, and you'll identify because this Truth be told, this is what we're doing. But in fishing terms, uh, we bait or we lure the fish in with something that looks good and healthy. Something that the fish sees and says, ah, I should probably eat that. It will be good for me. It will give me another day of life. And so a good fisherman knows how to use the right bait or the right lure to hide the hook to give it a presentation in such that it keeps that fish thinking, this is good for me, I need this, I better do this. And so the fish thinks it's getting the good end of the deal, all the while the fisherman knows that they're the ones actually benefiting from this arrangement. I've set this up to bait you, to hook you, to trap you, to take you, to lead you to the dinner table uh, for my benefit, or catch and release just for my fun whatever the case is. But the idea here is that Paul was not out there casting out something in front of them that looked good, but actually had a hook inside that would trap them and lead them into danger. No. Paul wanted them to know, and again, they already knew this. They were not there deceiving the people, baiting them, hooking them with ideas that would ultimately harm them. A successful ministry in God's eyes is one that is grounded upon the truth of God's Word. The preaching, the teaching, the exhortation is not contaminated by the error of human ideas and reasonings and philosophies, nor are they using the teaching to try to get personal, financial, sexual favors, whatever it is. No, it's simply taking the truth of God's Word and presenting it to the people. That's part of what makes a ministry successful in God's eyes. A third quality that defines successful ministry. A mission that is approved by God. Paul says that they spoke because they knew without a doubt that they had been appointed by God to be entrusted with the gospel. For a ministry to be successful like Paul's was in his time there in Thessalonica, it's important that it be a mission that is commissioned by God with a message that is directed by God. To just go out and do something good for the sake of doing something good, when God isn't leading it, when God isn't approving it, it doesn't make for great success. Instead, we need to be listening for the Lord trying to sense where he's leading, and when we discern what that is, we know what he's approved, we know what he is commissioning, that's when we do it. That's when we jump on it and go for it. Paul didn't just show up in Thessalonica because it was along the road, and he went, huh, I kind of like this place. I could see myself settling down here. It's got good food. 
I like the unique Greek culture, which, which is rare in a Roman world these days. And um, Man, the Aegean coast, what a beautiful, what a beautiful beach. I could see myself just sitting here day by day, taking in the rays. And of course, if someone wants to come up and talk about the gospel, of course, I would be more than willing. That was not Paul's take on his minish, in his mission. Paul's mission and ministry was designed by and approved by God, and God entrusted Paul with the gospel message for the purpose of what? Sharing it. Actually going and sharing it with everyone he could. Individual Christians and churches as a whole oftentimes engage in ministry activity simply because it may, well, it seems like an okay idea, or maybe because someone suggests it. Does your church do this? Because every successful church should do this. Do you have this ministry? Uh, or you have hands and feet and a mouth. Do you do this as a Christian? You should, because every Christian should. And sometimes it's like they're just random good things that may work someplace else, that God may have led another church or individual to do, and so we end up just adopting it and going with it when God hasn't even called us or burdened us to do it. Rather than just doing stuff for the sake of doing it, we need to be praying, God, what would you have us do? And get a sense that such and such ministry is something that God has actually opened the door for, that he has approved, that he has commissioned. And when we identify those things, that's what we should really begin to invest our time and our resources into, those are the ones that have ultimate success. And at that point, we begin to do them and we leave the results up to God. It doesn't mean that, well, because God approved this and He's commissioned us to go and do it and entrusted us with the words to say, that the numbers will explode and that things will be amazing. That's not necessarily what successful fruit looks like. We just have to leave it up to God. I have this in your notes. Write this down. Success is found in being faithful and obedient to do what God asks us to do. I mean, that is where we find our success as a ministry. Despite the visible fruit that we see or don't see, sometimes we won't see fruit because God is just using us to hold people accountable or to just plant a seed that will sprout later. Success is simply found in being faithful and obedient to do whatever it is God has asked us to do, regardless of the results that we see with our eyes. There's a fourth quality that describes successful ministry. They had an understanding of ultimate accountability to God. Paul says in verse 4 that God is the one who examines our hearts. He says in verse 5 that it is God who is witness of what we do. And he's contrasting this against our desire and temptation to please people first and foremost. Now, of course, it's not our job to go out there in the world and offend people. That's not what we're called to do. But we're also not called to go out there first and foremost to please people. Our main goal and aim needs to be to serve and please God at all costs. And if it ends up offending or disappointing someone, so be it. If it ends up pleasing someone, then great, that's a double bonus, that's a win-win. But when God calls us and appoints us to do something, we should boldly do it with confidence without concern that, well, so-and-so may be disappointed. So-and-so may not be pleased. It may make so-and-so angry. That's not to be our primary concern at all. And again, that doesn't mean that we go about our business in disregarding people and their feelings as if people and their feelings don't matter. Because, I mean, hey, it is the people we're trying to reach, right? Of course. But what this does mean is that we are to obey God first and foremost at any cost. And if it causes some people to be displeased out there, it is what it is. We don't bend to man's pleasure and in so doing, sidestep God's plan. 
We aren't to sugarcoat or leave portions of God's Word out because it's not uh, popular or because it might be offensive. No, we are to speak the truth, the whole truth, and do so in love, as the Bible says in Ephesians 4.15. We don't take the truth and go out there and teach it abrasively and abusively and then get excited. Oh, look how many people we offended today. We just were out there teaching the truth. I, I wrote a Bible verse on the end of my baseball bat and smacked someone upside the head with it, and they were like so offended by that, but it was the truth. I put my Bible slippers on and kicked someone, stepped on their toe, and I offended them with it. And No, we don't go out there with the goal of trying to offend people by preaching the truth abrasively and rudely. The truth is offensive enough as it is. We don't need to go and make it that way by our delivery. We are to preach and teach the whole truth graciously and lovingly, hoping that the people will respond well. And if they don't, it is what it is, so be it. Paul, Silas, and Timothy's ministry in Thessalonica was not in vain. In part, it's because they knew ultimately they would be standing accountable before God. God is the one examining their hearts. God is the one who is witnessing what they're doing. And they need to be concerned, first and foremost, about pleasing Him, not about pleasing the people around them. It wasn't that they were going to be standing before some guy in the end as judge. It's not that some random person is going to be there on the judgment seat when we stand before that after the rapture. That No, they knew that we will be, and we need to know, that we will be standing before Jesus Christ, our God and Savior. And that's the one that we need to be concerned with. What He feels about what we're doing. That's what gives a ministry the ability to be successful, is to be concerned about God's opinion and knowing we will be accountable to Him in the end. And now in verses 5 and 6, we see a fifth quality of successful ministry in God's eyes, and it's selfless service for the glory of God. Selfless service for the glory of God. Paul says he reveals four selfish things that were not part of their ministry. First of all, there was no flattering speech. Flattery is saying something that a person wants to hear. Oftentimes, it's not even true true or not, but it's saying something that someone else wants to hear because you want to get something from them. Flattery is motivated by greed. It's saying, you have something I want, so I'm just going to try to say whatever I can, butter you up so I can get that from you. Um, Back in the day uh, when they used to have the rodeos down there in Silverthorne underneath the dam. Any of you around during those days? That was back when I was a teenager. Um, they, uh, one of the years, along with the rodeo, they had a chili cook-off. And um, so I was there, and I was going through and tasting the different chilies, contemplating which one would get my vote. And there was a, I remember this very clearly, but there was a a team of two older ladies that had brought their chili, and as I was walking through, one of them said to the other one, hey, look at that guy. Have you ever seen a teenage guy with such a perfect complexion? It is amazing. Like, that's amazing. Have you ever seen that before? No, I haven't. That is truly amazing. And I'm like, this is awkward. I'm just trying to eat my chili here. And I'm thinking to myself, I know what you're doing. You're trying to buy my vote, aren't you? You want me to vote for your chili so that you get the win. Uh, Flattery. Whether or not they were being honest, I knew they were making such a big deal about all of this due to try to, it was flattery. Um, Paul's saying, look, that's not what we were about there. We weren't flattering people into following Jesus. It wasn't like, wow, now you 
you are beautiful. Jesus wants you to be in heaven because heaven is going to be a more beautiful place because of your beautiful face. So, I mean, and what a waste to expose such a beautiful face to the fiery flames of, of hell. Jesus wants you in heaven, your, your beautiful face. Or, dude, you are huge. You are ripped. Jesus likes people like you that take care of their body because, you know, that Holy Spirit, he wants an impressive te a temple to indwell. No, that's not what Paul was about. It wasn't flattering people. That wasn't his methodology. It was just straight truth. Secondly, no pretext for greed. The idea here is that they would have had greedy motives and they were trying to use the ministry as a cloak. That's the idea of that pretext, that, that they would use the ministry to hide or cover their greedy motives. We want stuff from people and they won't suspect it from a church ministry. And so let's go in and try to you know, hide our intentions. No, it wasn't about trying to get money or things or benefits or favors from people. Thirdly, it was, uh, there was no seeking glory for men, no glory from men. They were not there to get noticed and praised by people. They weren't seeking the applause of, of people. They wanted, if anything, people to see what they were doing and turn and glorify God as a result of it. They wanted to hear from Jesus' own lips, well done, good and faithful servant. That's what they were concerned about, not seeking glory from men. And finally, fourth, there was no exploiting their apostolic authority. Paul was a man that was uniquely called and gifted by God and appointed as an apostle, the office of apostle. But Paul did not use that authority to command people to do things for him or to get things or to give things to him. He didn't use that. He often passed up the exercise of his rights as an apostle when ministering to people so that there was never wondering, what is Paul's motive? Is he just in it for the money? Is he just in it for the popularity or the fame? Can he just like flex his apostolic muscles and get stuff from people? Is this why he's in it? No. In fact, we learn later in Thessalonians, he didn't ever receive financial support from them. He worked part-time to cover his expenses, and then he received financial support from the church in Philippi. But he never took any financial support from the Thessalonians so that there was never any wondering if it was due to selfish motives. So bottom line... These guys were there to give, selflessly give, selflessly serve. They were not there to receive. What made them successful in God's eyes is that they wanted to selflessly serve God by serving God's people for the glory of God. And so we find Paul here in this opening portion of this chapter in a way reminiscing with the saints there, about the things that they already knew, because they were there, they witnessed it, but revealing what made the ministry impact in Thessalonica so successful. He didn't walk away and say, yeah, that was all in vain. No, it was successful ministry. It's probable that another reason why Paul mentions this, you say, well, what would have brought this subject up if they knew it, if Paul knew it, why did he even write this? Uh, it's probable that Paul is also, in writing this, defending himself against some people that were trying to tear down his credibility. Remember, when they entered Thessalonica and preached the gospel, it caused a lot of opposition. There were Jews that believed, but then there were a lot of Jews that didn't believe, that got angry, that kicked them out of the synagogue, and there was a lot of unbelieving Gentiles and they tried to run them out of town altogether and were successful in that. The unbelieving population of Thessalonica did not like the church. They wanted to extinguish it. And if persecution didn't extinguish it, it only drove the church in further and caused it to grow. Well, if we can't beat it and intimidate it out of our city, maybe we can tear it down by discrediting the guys that came in 
that were leaders. And so you have people saying, yeah, these guys were in it for greedy motives. These guys, they're sexual perverts. They're looking to exploit you like these other temples around here. They were just in it to try to wield their apostolic authority to get what they wanted from you. Paul's like, no, you guys remember. You remember what we did. You were there. It was not in vain. It was successful. So Paul wrote this as a bit of a defense, but also as a reminder of how amazingly God was working in their midst, conducting ministry that was valuable. Well, maybe, may we as a church, may we as individual ministers of the Lord Jesus Christ, may we display these same qualities in what we do and thereby engage in ministry that is truly successful in God's eyes. Let's pray. Lord, we want to again thank you for your word and the insight we gain from this passage specifically. As we see Paul recount the time that he was there, we've discovered a lot of the qualities, the marks that made that ministry so successful. We really want that to, to describe us as well, Lord. We don't want to be getting involved in things that in the end amount to nothing or that are in vain. We want to get involved in serving you in such a way that it makes eternal impact, that it bears fruit um, that lasts for eternity. So help us as a church, help us as individuals. Thank you, God, for being gracious enough to not only save us, but then to choose to use us for things like this. So may we be busy about your work this week. Prepare us as we come back again next week and continue on in your word. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you all for being with us here this morning. And uh, may God bless you all. We are dismissed.